Hearing okay? We can. All right. So my name is Evan Tompkins, and today we will be talking about the STAR program that stands for Support Team Assisted Response, known as STAR. This program is administered in Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. I am the STAR program specialist, so I oversee the administration for this program. Um, I sometimes act for a figurehead uh, to represent this program. I'm happy to be here today. Um, I also have Maria Martin and Stephanie Van Jacobs presenting with me today. Uh, Maria, if you'd like to introduce yourself, followed by Stephanie. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria Martin. She, her, a uh, pronouns. I am the STAR Community Services Director at Servicios de la Raza. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Van Jacobs. I am the Clinical Program Manager for the STAR program. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll hear from uh, both of the co-hosts later on in this presentation. So STAR deploys uh, emergency response that includes EMTs or paramedics and behavioral health clinicians to engage individuals in distress. Uh, this can be in relation to mental health issues, poverty, homelessness, substance use, or resource needs. Uh, STAR responds to low-risk calls where there are no significant safety concerns. STAR is dispatched through Denver 911. Uh, this can be through the 911, the non-emergency number, or there's a 10-digit STAR hotline. The team can provide medical assessment, triage, um, crisis intervention, de-escalation, and connection to community resource. Um, STAR teams can transport clients to these resources as necessary. Uh, the STAR program operates in the city and county of Denver. So the city and county is just one in the same. So city of Denver. So what is STAR? So STAR is an alternative response program where we send a response that truly meets the needs of the individual. You know, for years, 911 has kind of been a catch-all system. There's been a lot of calls that come into 911 that might not have been best handled by 911. You know, if you think about it, it really doesn't make sense to send a police officer if there's a fire. So in that kind of same vein of thought, you know, we now have the ability to send an appropriate uh, response to people in low level distress. So the STAR team is really just the evolution of how we respond to people in distress without major safety concerns. You know, STAR provides the ability to respond and meet people's individual needs that may be more appropriately handled by a behavioral health clinician and an EMT provider. You know, this really allows people in distress to help de-escalate and receive resources in a way that is truly beneficial to them and their well-being. So really trying to get people, you know, um, help them de-escalate, help them get a resource that is, um, you know, might be beneficial. And it also really diverts calls from traditional police responses, you know, and that helps allow our police to focus their time and attention on matters that really require a police presence. So currently we have five vans in service with the six backup van. Um, each team is made up of a behavioral health clinician and a paramedic. So each van has one BH clinician and one EMT when they're in service. Um, again, Dep Denver Department of um, Health and Environment administers this program and we contract with a number of partner organizations to make this program run effectively. So our behavioral health clinicians are contracted through WellPower and then our paramedics are contracted through Denver Health and Hospital Authority um, we administer this program in partnership with 911. Uh, the day-to-day -day operations of this program run through Denver 911. So all of our call, calls are triaged through 911. Uh, we also have Servicios de la Raza. Um, that's a new partnership that we have this year. And they are going to provide, well, they do provide, you know, connection to culturally, linguistically, and geographically appropriate follow-up services. 
you know, so response to distress can look different depending on the situation. Uh, we respond to public health needs that are more appropriately responded to by our team. Um, all of our calls are routed through Denver 911. So in Denver, 911 is separate from the police. So our 911 is made up of civilian call takers and dispatch. Uh, the civilian call takers will screen all calls for star appropriateness. This screening is still the same for all incoming calls. So whether you call 911, the non-emergency number, the 10 digit star hotline, or if you're just calling for some other matter, you know, when you call 911, they're gonna ask about weapons, injury, you know, time frame of a response needed, um, safety issue, and then just what is the issue overall. So again, start response to low risk calls. So if there's no weapons or safety concerns or major injuries, and it kind of falls into one of the categories that STAR responds to. Um, again, our call takers have been trained to kind of assess and flag those calls for a STAR team response. Um, you can call in and specifically ask for the STAR team. Um, again, that triage process will still be the same, and the calls will still need to meet uh, STAR criteria. Um, again, uh, you know, community members can call in and ask for uh, a star response. If you see someone else um, in distress, you know, I don't know how many of us live in Denver here, but most of us who live in Denver have kind of seen someone who could use some help. Um, years before I took this position, I used to live in an area and there was this woman who would be, you know, screaming late at night and I could you know, I could tell that she was in distress. Um, it wasn't a huge safety concern, but it sounded like this individual was having some sort of mental health concern. Um, so I wish, you know, STAR had been available for me to call at that time. But again, you know, we've all seen individuals in the community who maybe could use someone to talk to or are clearly in distress. So you can call in and request STAR to you know, get someone the appropriate response. Um, Cause even at that time I knew, you know, if I called 911, I thought, well, what are they really going to do for this individual? So we now have a way to get people appropriate care if they're in distress. Um, working with the STAR team is always voluntary. Um, it's not something that we ever force upon individuals. So it's always voluntary to work with the STAR team. However, you know, when you approach people kind of in a kind, empathetic and caring way, um, and even in, in a ther therapeutic way, you know, the level of engagement and willing to work with our team is really high. Um, what's great about STAR is that we can work with people for as long as needed. You know, the STAR team will strive to find some sort of solution or response to benefit the person in distress. Um, sometimes our star vans might spend, you know, 60 to 90 minutes on a single encounter. Um, you know, sometimes they even spend longer than that. And then our vans are in operation from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week. Uh, some of our core values, we wanna be culturally responsive, you know, having a program that will include responders and providers, we share lived experiences and identify with Denver's diverse population. Um, in doing so, we hope the program can be more trustworthy and responsible to the community that it serves. Um, so again, we're excited about our partnership with Servicios de la Raza, um, and we hope that can kind of um, build trust in different communities within the city of Denver. And we'll talk more about that partnership later. Um, you know, as far as holistic care, one of the keys to success for the STAR program is the recognition that the van itself is really just one mechanism that lives within a continuum of care uh, and support for people who are in distress. Uh, holistic care kind of ensures connecting people in distress with long-term support services and treatment to reduce repeat calls. So, you know, it's great that we can help people in distress. We can help de-escalate people 
But again, what happens next? Can we get them into long-term care? Can we help them find that continuum of care so that they can you know, receive care in a way that's beneficial to them? Um, we also really strive to do no harm. So we take a do no harm approach and use harm reductionist approach, you know, kind of recognizing that every distress call might not be resolved in that moment, but rather navigated and created trust with the person in distress to help them continue through uh, programs and services that meet their needs. And then really focusing on healthy de-escalation as the guiding principle um, for people in distress. So again, when you're calling in for a start response, you know, they'll ask about weapons, injuries, time, and safety. We have different nature codes that the STAR team responds to. You can kind of think of these as little buckets that the 911 has of what the issue is. Um, this is constantly changing and evol evolving. Uh, this year, we added the nature code family disturbance. So in, uh, incidents between non-intimate partners. So, you know, if a son is fighting with the mom and 911 gets called, that's something that the STAR team can now respond to. Um, some of the other things we respond to are assists, uh, disturbances, um, indecent exposure, intoxicated person, uh, suicidal series, trespass, and welfare check. Um, so again, to utilize STAR, um, you can call 911, the non-emergency number, or the STAR hotline, which is a 720-913-STAR number. And again, all those calls are routed through Denver 911. Um, so really what to expect for a STAR response. Um, just remember the triage, they're gonna ask about scene safety, injury, weapons, and what seems to be the issue surrounding the call. Um, again, you can directly request that the STAR team, um, you know, you can directly request for STAR services, um, but you're still gonna be asked to provide information surrounding the situation of what's going on. So a challenge that the STAR team ran into um, earlier on was a person might call for STAR in distress. They specifically stated that they didn't want to engage with the police. Um, you know, the STAR van was busy back to back for hours. So then that call ended up back up in the call queue and eventually it was, uh, assigned to police. And so then that person ended up getting a police response, which is what they really uh, asked not to have happen. So we really made some um, changes and improvements so that we could avoid that issue. So we now have the ability with this policy update that star appropriate calls will be held for a star team um, until they're available. You know, if a call matches criteria for star calling, um, the star calling party might request a star only response or no response. Um, so we can now guarantee that if a call is, you know, star appropriate and the person really doesn't want the police and they only want star, we can um, make sure that that person gets star or no response only. Um, this is pretty revolutionary. In the past, you know, calling 911 it really didn't matter what you called for. Like at some point in time, you were going to get a response. So now we have the ability to say, okay, you know, the start team might be busy for a few hours. Are you okay to wait? And then if they say yes, you know, they'll either send star team or send no one. Um, they do always let callers know, like if something changes that at any time, again, they can call back if they want a different response. Oops. So the start program started July 1st, 2020, but to really understand how this program came to be, uh, I wanna go back to kind of the beginning of a different program called the co-responders program. So since 2016, we've had a program where uh, a police officer was paired with a behavioral health clinician um, that would respond to 911 calls. 
through that union, the pathway for a Starlight program was kind of laid. You know, police officers could understand the benefits of working with behavioral health clinicians. They could uh, see in real time how a clinician could de-escalate a person and provide support in a therapeutic way. Um, police officers were able to learn skills from behavioral health clinicians that they were working with. Um, so that program is great. It's still in existence. Uh, Co-responders, you know, they can respond to a higher level um, of call that maybe has some safety concerns that STAR would not respond to. Um, during the time that there was only co-responders, there started to come th this realization that some of these lower level calls where there were no safety risks or injuries really didn't require a police presence. Um, so the clinician could adequately, adequately handle the call. And then in sometimes, you know, just the presence of a police officer led to the person escalating. So this thought began to percolate, you know, is there a way to respond to these low level distress calls where, um, you know, we can get people the resources, the help they need without having a police response. So during that time too, there's a lot of community activists who are also kind of coming to that same thought of like, how can we have an alternative response to protect our communities, you know, with low level mental health calls or calls that don't necessarily require the police? Is there a different way that we can respond? So in 2019, um, a group of people from Well Powers, Servicios de la Raza, some of these community activists, um, people from the city of Denver, they went and saw this CAHOOTS program in Eugene, Oregon. So CAHOOTS is kind of the original grandfather of all of these alternative response programs. Um, so they went and viewed this program, um, they saw how it worked, and then they kind of took some of those ideas back from the CAHOOTS program and pitched it to the city of Denver. So then we started a pilot uh, July 1st, 2020. So the pilot July 1st, 2020 um, was funded by Caring for Denver. It just had one van and limited hours in downtown District 6. Um, during this initial pilot, it was a lot about figuring out how this would actually system would actually work in the city of Denver. Um, you know, how would this team made up of a BH clinician and an ENT be able to respond to triage calls through 911? Um, during the earlier days of the STAR team, they had more time to do outreach and kind of respond to people they may have encountered previously in distress. Um, so they did have time to kind of do follow up on previous calls. Uh, one of the things that was done well during the pilot was data collection. Um, data collection from the pilot included, you know, what calls were responded to, the types of calls that were responded to, kind of when and where those calls for STAR were coming in. And they also collected, um, yeah, what time those occurred at. So from that information, they were able to assess that 95% of the calls were coming in from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And so that's kind of how our current operating hours were formed. Um, many of the community activists who went to Eugene, Oregon, they wanted to be a part of the STAR program still. So the STAR Advisory um, Community Advisory Council was formed so that we could keep the community involved and hear their voice in the STAR program, really keeping uh, STAR aligned with its ideals and provide advice and program in shaping the future of this program. So we think it's important to, you know, always, you know, consider what the community wants and needs um, as we shape this program and as we expand. Um, again, we also work with WellPower. They have our BH clinicians. Uh, Servicios de la Raza, they provide this network of follow-up care. Um, Denver 911, um, they do, you know, the day-to-day -day operations. Denver Health and Hospital Authority has our EMTs and paramedics. And then we have Urban Institute, who we pay to do some third-party evaluations of the program. So we started, you know, with that one van, and then in 2022, we expanded to five vans with 10 teams of made up of one BH clinician and one EMT. 
Um, in 2023, we're expanding to eight vans in service with 16 teams, again, still made up of a behavioral health clinician and an EMT. Um, our eventual goal is to be 24 seven. However, we're kind of working on increasing our scale and expanding in a way so that we can adequately meet the demand of our current time period uh, before we go to 24 seven. Um, so we're funded um, primarily through our general fund in Caring for Denver. So Caring for Denver is a tax initiative in Denver that for every $100, there is a 25 cent tax um, and that some of that funding goes to mental health, substance use issues and alternative to policing. So the initial pilot was 100 percent funded through Caring for Denver with, I think, about two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. Not all of that money was even spent because in Colorado, we can bill Medicaid and Medicare for some of our clinical services, which really heavily offset the cost. Um, in 2021, the STAR program operations were roughly a million dollars to run. And then in 2022, I'm estimating that it was probably about 2.5 million to run the program. Um, since 2021, we've had about $7 million of funding. So, you know, we're thankful that we're a well-funded program, you know, from the citizens of Denver really pushing for that um, Caring for Denver initiative. And then just our general fund allowing to support this program. Um, we've had more money than we can use, but frankly, it just takes time to scale these programs, you know, getting the right staff, um, getting the right equipment. Uh, COVID has really thrown a wrench in a few things of trying to get vans and um, different, um, different items that we need to run this program. All right. Steph, would you like to kind of talk about WellPower in your role? Uh, sure, I can just briefly go over it. So uh, WellPower is Denver's community mental health center, uh, formerly known as Mental Health Center of Denver. So you guys might be familiar with that, the old name. Uh, we rebranded uh, a little over a year and a half ago. Uh, so the WellPower clinicians are contracted to be in the van and provide the mental health support within each STAR van. Uh, all of our clinicians are master's level. About half of them are licensed or are working towards licensure. Uh, the reason for that is that it's an alternative response. And so we definitely want to be uh, doing that and coming up with alternative responses as opposed to the old traditional way of uh, uh, responding within the community. So all of our mental health clinicians uh, have really the time and discretion to meet individuals where they are uh, within the community and on the STAR van. So they can provide that immediate support, however that may look. Uh, sometimes it's just providing a snack and a water bottle, and other times it's connection to other community partners or other resources uh, such as Servicios de la Raza within our community. So I'm happy to answer some other questions about WellPower in general, if you would like. WellPower overall is a rather large uh, community mental health facility that has uh, outpatient therapy uh, from uh, young ages all the way into older uh, with, you know, uh, psychiatry uh, therapy. We have vocational training. We have really anything you could think of uh, as long as, uh, as far as behavioral health. So I'm happy to answer those questions specifically uh, without getting into too much detail. But that is a very brief overview on our well-powered clinicians. All right. And then I was wondering, Steph, if you would kind of be sharing like maybe what this work kind of looks like in the field. If you have any thoughts of like, working in the field, what it what it might look like? Yeah, so for the clinicians on the STAR van, this is really a, a community response um, or in crisis. And as we all know, or if not, crisis can be self-identified. And so it's really important for our clinicians to respond in a way that is really meeting people where the, they're at. So in the field, that really can look like numerous different things, right? We really want to listen to the individuals we're making contact with. 
And so the clinician's able to use all different kinds of skill sets. It could be traditional de-escalation. It could be different therapeutic uh, modules. Um, and it could just be having a conversation. So really, we are adapting to what our community needs within uh, each call in each situation. So the clinicians are trained to be able to provide those connections to resources and other community partners. So within the field, that can look a little bit non-traditional compared to traditional social work or a therapeutic work within an office, right? So you are uh, kind of taking a step back and walking alongside those individuals as, a, as opposed to meeting an individual in a traditional therapeutic session. Awesome. Thank you, Steph. All right. So our partnership with Servicios de Arraza is uh, pretty new, but we're really excited about the work that they're doing. So yeah, I just wanted to have Maria talk about the work that Servicios, the great work that you are, are doing and what that looks like. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Evan mentioned, we are the newest expansion of STAR. Um, Servicios does hold the contract, um, but we did organize a STAR community coalition that is currently made up of five other nonprofit organizations. Um, through all the data, what we did learn is that communities of color are underutilizing STAR uh, for several different reasons. And it is a great resource that everybody should have access to um, and be educated on. And so, as he also mentioned that there is a mistrust in the community, um, a lot of communities of color also do not utilize 911. Um, and so part of our role also is to provide the education and outreach um, to let our communities know about this amazing resource um, and kind of build that trust back with community and even with STAR in general and know that it is an alternative response. Um, and so we receive the referrals directly from the STAR van. So after the initial response, and there are times also that the vans do call us and if we're available and they're needing extra support that we do go to that initial call as well. Um, and so the five nonprofit organizations that are also a part of this STAR Community Coalition are Dasher, Muslim Family Services, Grasp, Face It, and Struggle of Love Foundation. Um, as I mentioned, the referrals do come straight to Servicios initially. Um, and then we kind of go through a decision factor, um, decision making around what the best culturally responsive, linguistic specific, and geographically appropriate um, support the individual is needing. And so Servicios does not always keep all of the referrals based on what information we are provided. And we do refer those out to other partners that are in the STAR Community Coalition and also externally, if that is a better fit. Um, all of our services are individualized to the person's needs. So everybody coming in, you know, they identify their own needs. They're the expert of their own lives. Um, we support them and meet them where they're at. And again, it is voluntary. Nothing is forced upon anybody. Um, kind of the first support that everybody does get is case management. Um, and that looks very different. If there are case managers on the call, we know we kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, and so anything from mental health, support and connecting to shelters, long-term housing, uh, connect to any financial support around needing support with the utilities paid, stuff like that. Um, we also have folks that you know, feel safer on the streets versus in the shelters. And so how can we provide support to them and support them in being safe? And so sometimes that looks like just providing survival gear, uh, 
again, also using a harm reduction approach. Servicios as an organization, we have a lot of different programs. And so there are um, internal referrals made sometimes right away to our behavioral health peer support. Um, other times it's to our health enrollment um, teams to get them enrolled in benefits. Uh, we also have a victim services program here as well. And so again, it just depends what the individual or family's needs are. Um, we operate Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, and yeah, as Stephanie mentioned, a lot of crisis work as well, and that can look very different. We are in the shelters a lot. We're in the community a lot, uh, providing transportation. Um, and trying to also help them meet their basic needs. I think to something that is great like STAR is we also, it's not a, a time frame. You know, we can work with individuals as long as they're needing or as short as they're needing. And if they're only wanting one resource from a, us, then that's, that's fine. But at least they now know another resource in the community that they can reach out to. Um, but yeah, I'm, as he said too, a lot of it is just that after wraparound services um, and connecting people within their community of, of where they're at. And so not forcing them to be with a provider that um, is across town or doesn't understand their cultural needs either. Happy to answer any other questions, um, but we've, We've been now taking referrals since the end of April, so we are still new, but a lot of work has been done just in a short period of time. Awesome, thank you, Maria. Yeah, we're excited to see what this, um, you know, partnership can bring in the future. Um, again, they are pretty brand new, only being with us since April, but we have a referral system up and running, and you know, we've been seeing a lot of clients get into some sort of follow-up services. So we're really excited about that because again, you know, it's great that we have STAR, but thinking about that pathway of, you know, how can we get people, maybe STAR is that first step into getting in someone into long-term care. And maybe, you know, with working with Servicios, they might not need, feel the need to call 911. They might be like, hey, I have the resources now. I can call my case manager. I can call my therapist or you know, I'm not falling into that level of distress because some of these basic needs they help provide um, were available to me. All right. So our Community Advisory Council, um, they are really there to ensure start to its program's fidelity to the core values. Um, they advise us on the integration of community engagement services and our emergency response component of STAR um, really helped create awareness and understanding of the STAR program within the commu community. And then in partnership with Denver Department of Public Health and Environment, kind of act as an ambassador for the program. Um, just some functions of the group are data tracking, um, evaluation of outcomes for the STAR programs, and then ensuring um, you know, we're sticking to our core values. And then discussing uh, community feedback from the community regarding the STAR program. Uh, we do have monthly meetings, um, community advisory meetings. Um, it's something that the general public can attend where we listen to uh, sentiment, feedback, and try to really figure out what the community wants. You know, a big part of my job is to kind of lead those meetings and make sure that we can try and integrate as much as possible from the community um, into this program so there can be a community-driven aspect to this program. Um, if you do live in Denver, I believe they are currently taking applications to be part of this um, advisory council. If that's something that you're interested in, um, you can check out the website and there's going to be an application um, up and available. So it's Urban Go ahead. We do have a uh, comment question in the chat. It's from Jessica, who says, I'm in rural Colorado, Walden specifically, which is probably about as far northwest as you can get. 
She asks, how can I be of assistance with the STAR program? We don't have any DVSA advocates up here. Closest is an hour, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that, that kind of opens up the broader question that probably a lot of our attendees have of, are there any ideas about expanding this statewide or what, how would you see this going statewide? Because it seems like such a great program for everybody. Yeah, so I I wouldn't see the STAR program going statewide, but there's a lot of different communities that are starting these programs. Um, so there's one in you know Aurora, there's one in um, Arvada, they're starting one in like the Georgetown area. Um, so, you know, I think it it's probably going to be, it'd be a lot easier instead of star expanding statewide to really try and like implement one of these programs within your community. Um, so, I mean, as far as how to do that, you know, our team is always happy to meet with individuals interested to talk about how to start these programs. Um, but I think, you know, having a partnership with, you know, the police, um, understanding um, where they're at, you know, having community buy-in, having community activists who start pushing for these things, you know, getting city council involved and on the same page, um, starting to have some of those conversations of what an alternative response could look like. Um, because honestly, it's going to, we what we tell people when we meet with people to is it's going to look a lot different wherever you are. Like Denver is a lot different from rural Colorado. So, um, you know, how the Georgetown program operates is going to be, you know, somewhat different than what we do in Denver. But we, you can still take some of the basic pieces and really use that as an idea to form one of these programs. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Urban Institute is our third party evaluator. Um, they've been evaluating us, well, for like two years now, um, but from their year one um, evaluation, just some of the um, key takeaways they had was started being effective in meeting the immediate needs of individuals through long-term connections to service. Although long-term connections to service remain a major challenge, Staff reported that the ability to connect people to culturally and geographically appropriate services is limited by their knowledge of providers and their capacity. So again, hearing that feedback is something that also helped us push to look for a partnership to follow, have that follow-up care. Um, this year, we're having Urban Institute kind of evaluate our relationship with Servicios de la Raza figuring out how it was established, um, how we can improve in the future. And then we're having them collect uh, surveys on star clients to get responses about real experiences um, within the van. Um, we have had a lack of, you know, firsthand feedback about what it is like to utilize star. So we're really hoping getting that firsthand feedback will help us improve the program. And then next year, um, we're having them do a cost and outcome study. So trying to figure out what are the associated costs with these programs? Um, what does the long-term effect of utilizing the STAR van or the STAR network look like compared with similar individuals who did not have a STAR experience? Um, for these types of alternative programs, they're popping up all over the nation. Like I have a PDF of listing um, of different programs that probably has a hundred different programs on it through throughout the U.S. that have been started or are starting now, uh, but there hasn't been a lot of research into the cost effectiveness of these programs. Um, so I'm real excited about that because I think one of the big questions when starting a program like this is, well, how much is it is it going to cost? Who's going to pay for it? Um, when we're hoping that what the data shows is that this program is actually gonna save the city of Denver money because we're taking things off the police's plate. We're allowing them to respond to things that they actually need to. And then we have an EMT and a para or a paramedic right there. Um, and one of the benefits is that is that they can help address um, you know, basic 
medical questions or issues with the people there. So, um, you know, instead of everyone just going to their emergency room, you know, do they just need their prescription picked up? Can we give them a ride there? Can we take them to an urgent care? Can we help them schedule something with their doctor? Or if they do need to go to the hospital, like we can, you know, help transport there. And the EMT and paramedic can kind of provide a warm handoff, which can be really beneficial. Oh, thanks, Maria. I was just looking at what was in the chat. Um, just some program data from um, STAR responded to 8,034 calls from July 1st, 2020, the start of the pilot through the end of 2022. Um, currently, with this year, we have responded to over 12,000 calls. Um, we've served over 4,000 unique individuals in our clinical encounters, and we've provided over 1,800 transports. Um, in 2022, we responded to 5,719 calls. Um, this was made up of uh, 2,667 clinical calls, and we had 1,185 transports. So this graph on the right shows the STAR incidents by problem type. Um, as you can see, welfare check, uh, assist, and then suicidal person or suicidal series were kind of the top calls that we, we responded to in 2022. Um, and this just kind of shows the clinical and non-clinical encounters by month for 2022, along with the combined total encounters. Um, Steph, can you just quickly give a little information on like what the difference between a clinical and non-clinical encounter is, just so everyone's aware? Yeah, absolutely. And I apologize, I've been having ongoing issues with my camera and it just turned off again. Uh, so non-clinical and clinical encounters um, are different in the sense of the interaction that takes place. So a clinical encounter could look more like uh, connecting an individual to Servicios de la Raza or other community partners. Uh, it could mean uh, a longer interaction. And non-clinical interactions could just be in real time providing uh, snacks and water or clothing that we house on the vans, uh, maybe a shorter connection of just immediately um, coming to a solution or providing advocacy in that moment. Um, the foundation of them are very the same, are very, uh, very similar in the sense that we are still providing support uh, clinically or non-clinically. Uh, in a data sense, it's really just the interaction uh, that took place in which lane that's in. Thank you, Steph. All right, so then in 2022, we had 2,667 clinical encounters with serving 1,970 people. And then we had 2,651 non-clinical encounters um, serving, you know, 1,619 well, some of that people. Um, so this graphic just kind of shows the breakdown of Denver's race and ethnicity in light blue. And then it shows the kind of percentage of the star clients that were of that race or ethnicity um, that we served in 2022. So you can see in 2022, you know, Denver's made up of roughly 9% Black or African American. And that was about uh, one fifth of our clients. Um, you can also see that, you know, the Hispanic or Latino population makes up about a third of Denver's population, but we were only um, serving about 10% of the Hispanic or Latino population. Um, so there's definitely an underutilization of this population here. Um, you know, we're hoping with our partnership with Servicios de la Raza, um, you know, that they, when they provide follow-up care and help us build trust in different communities, that will be able to kind of, you know, increase the number of some of these uh, different groups that might be underutilizing the START program. Um, this just shows the age breakdown of people that we work through. Um, about half of our clients were between 18 and 40. Um, in 2023, we did add family disturbance as a nature code. 
So that could lead to more people um, under the age of 17 um, being served by the star van in the future. So, you know, in the future, we'll have to see if this changes with that addition of that nature code. Um, this just breaks down our clinical encounters by district through Denver. Um, most of our encounter, clinical encounters were happening in Denver's downtown District 6. Um, it has a high percentage of unhoused individuals, which we spend a lot of time um, providing services to. And also Denver District 6 was our downtown district where the pilot started. So, you know, that area might be a lot more familiar with the STAR program. So it will be interesting to see over time as we continue this program years in the future if these uh, percentages um, do change. As far as follow-up services in 2022, um, within 90 days of a STAR encounter um, in 2022, Wellpower reported um, 13,365 services provided. Um, and you can see the breakdown of those services over here. So some of those follow-up services were case management, residential services, crisis emergency, and then outreach services. Uh, this is a map, a heat map of Denver of the calls that came in in 2022. Um, it's really cool that we can kind of have this because this really shows, um, you know, helps us with our data and thinking about the STAR program. But you can see that most of our calls were coming in that downtown um, central Denver area. You know, the darker the color means more calls were coming in. But you can also see that we're re responding to the whole city. So there's different kind of hot spots throughout the city where you can see a darker color. That means that more calls have been um, coming in from that area. Um, in 2022, we had 1,185 transports. Uh, medical care was the highest with 413 and 35%, followed by our shelters at 230 and 20% and the Solution Center, which was 181 and 15%. So the Solution Center is something unique and awesome that we have in the city of Denver. Um, it's a facility for people in crisis or distress that um, the only way you can get into that facility is working with a first responder. So police, fire, you know, EMS, STAR team, um, any sort of first responder can take clients to this Solution Center and people can stay there up to 30 days as needed for different types of treatment. Um, so what's great about that is kind of ensuring that, you know, working, if you're working with a first responder, you know, that they do have a place just specifically for first responders to make sure that there's somewhere that they can take people who are in need of services. So this is kind of a heat map during the day uh, of when our calls were coming into in 2022. On the left, we have the calls responded to. Um, you can see the darker color, the red and the orange is higher number of calls. Um, and then, you know, green is lesser number of calls. So you can see most of our calls are really coming in between the 6 a.m. and uh, 10 p.m. timeframe where we're in operation. Um, this shows that all the calls that were identified in 2022. So again, you can see even all the identified calls were during that 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. time. So in 2022, we responded to 5,719 calls, but that was out of this 13,008 calls. So there was 7,289 calls that we did not get to respond to. Um, from inception to um, the end of 2022, we responded to 8,034 calls out of 23,917 identified calls. So that's been 15,888 calls that were not responded to. So for 2022, um, our response rate to these calls were like 44%. And then for Overall, from inception to the end of 2022, we were at 34% um, of a response. 
So we are responding. You can see over time we're responding to more calls. However, this really shows why we need to continue expanding. Um, there's a huge need for STAR, and we're, you know, right now maybe hitting 50% of the calls that are available for STAR. So we really hope that we can keep expanding until we can really meet the demand of the city. Just some future goals. We really wanna continue strengthening our bond with our community advisory group. Um, we're working with them right now to figure out the best ways that we can work together, uh, making sure we are you know, transparent in what we're doing and things that we can implement and trying to make sure that we're really listening to the needs of the community as well. So really hoping to continue that growth and evolution with community engagement and perspective. Um, in the future, we do wanna be 24 seven, have service 24 um, seven, you know, and we've thought about potentially adding peer support specialists to this program in some manner, um, you know, having a different type of care um, available to people. And we just wanna keep expanding till we can really meet the demand of the city of Denver. And then continuing our growth of our follow-up network with Servicios de la Raza. Um, we're excited about that partnership and its growth. So want to keep working there. And then you continue to use our evaluations with Urban Institute to kind of lead towards the growth and evolution of this program. Um, for 24-7 coverage, you know, some things we would need is behavioral health and EMT staff to work overnight. We would need additional managerial support, probably on-call support and team leads, and then case managers overnight and growth of that Servicios de la Raza network. Um, to go 24-7, you know, we would probably require at least four additional vans in service with one additional backup van. And then some things we have to think about for 24-7 is there's not a lot of services that are readily available overnight. So what does that look like working with STAR overnight? You know, during the day, we can take people to a shelter. We can refer them to WellPower or that network with Servicios de la Raza. But what, what is going to happen overnight? So again, you know, it's something maybe we could start with a pilot to kind of learn and understand what those additional hours might bring, um, what kind of challenges that might possess before we go to a full citywide coverage of 24-7. But that is something we're starting to talk about, and it's definitely, you know, on our horizon of trying to get to 24-7 coverage. Um, if you want additional information on the STAR program, you can just go to denvergov.org and search STAR. Um, I do have this hyperlink here, and I'll share the PDF version of these slides with uh, your organization here. And if you have follow-up questions, you can always send me an email. But I guess at this time, I would just open it up to any questions that um, any of you might have about STAR or this program. Hey, Evan, I have a, a few quick things to add. Oh, okay, um, go ahead. Yeah, I think especially because most of um, the folks on the on this webinar um, are advocates or vol volunteer advocates, um, just talking more about the calls that we do get around DV. Um, with our community coalition, we haven't specifically got any SA yet um, or that the reason the vans were called was specific to that. Once we've started working with folks, we do hear about that history, but we do, um, and Stephanie can speak more to this, the vans that do go to the DV calls, as long as there is not a safety risk and kind of, you know, those get handled a little bit differently and more immediate and urgent. And so one thing that, one thing, or how that looks like is, you know, there's been calls where the van's on site, they're helping, you know, mom and, and some kids hurry and pack a few things to get out of the house before um, partner comes home. And at the same time, coordinating with me and my team on figuring out a hotel that they can stay at, what immediate resources we can connect them with and immediate needs that we can uh, provide support. Um, 
And so those calls, I think we have seen an increase as far as those DV calls and star responding to those. Um, and so I just wanted to also kind of bring that to your all you guys' attention because most of you are advocates on the call, um, that those are definitely calls that we have been responding to as long as there's not a safety um, risk in place, which, you know, if there's mention of weapons and things like that, you know, Star, Star would not respond. Um, but those are things um, and areas I think that as far as the Star Community Coalition that we are growing in as well and being able to provide that cultural response, right? Because culturally responsive is not just about race and ethnicity, but, you know, many different things. And so if there are questions specific to how STAR works with uh, individuals who are victims and or survivors of DV or SA, please feel free to um, ask those. And, and Stephanie, if you have any other specific examples or um, things that have came up around that specific population you'd like to share. Yeah, I think I'll just add on to what you said. Uh, it's really beneficial for STAR when we do respond to these very sensitive situations or calls that STAR can really spend as much time needed to provide that advocacy and support. Um, and, and Maria is absolutely correct when she's saying there has been been an influx and so when star responds out to these calls star is able to sit with the individuals the family or children and make sure that we can provide a connection in real time and so sometimes that connection is calling servicios de la raza and having them come out to have that continuum of care to make sure they're not falling through the cracks other times it's that collaboration with our community partners to provide transportation to a, a safe situation or a safe shelter. And so we are definitely taking the time to make sure that we can provide as much support in real time on those calls um, and doing that in a way that is trauma informed, that is culturally responsive as Maria was touching on. And so I think we'll continue to evolve within the STAR program uh, to make sure we can better support individuals in those situations. I will say that we do have uh, a walk-in crisis center on 4353 East Colfax, uh, which is right off of Colfax in Colorado. This is a 24-7 walk-in crisis facility that any individual can, uh, can enter into without an appointment. Uh, to uh, to receive that like immediate support. Just wanted to throw that out there in case you were not aware of that resource as well. Uh, but when you do call STAR, STAR can provide that assistance and that support or advocacy to get you connected to the appropriate or get the individual connected uh, to the appropriate support or resource. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, well, if there's any questions, we're happy to answer any other questions about, you know, the STAR program or our STAR response. This is Sierra. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. However, if you all are still thinking about those, feel free to do so. Um, thank you so much, Evan and Stephanie and Maria. And I did see Maria, you just put your information in the chat and I see Evan, you have yours up on the screen. I'm wondering, Stephanie, if you could put your information in the chat as well. I'm thinking that maybe people might think over the information that you all have shared and maybe just assessing like the cross section of responding um, to individuals in crisis. I think that that, you know, might raise some questions in the future or how, you know, organizations can continue to support each other. So I think that that would be really helpful. Um, Kathy did just put our survey in the chat. So if all of you could click in there and give us some feedback, that would be great. And again, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat, but feel free to reach out to individuals um, 